you got it. We have our R for our rhema word, and then we have our K for our, sorry for my enunciation, koinonia, meaning fellowship. Thank you. Thank you. I practiced it, actually. I knew I was going to get it right before I said that. <laughs> all right. But this is fantastic. And although they are all good, I love the agape. I love the rhema. I really want to focus on the koinonia today. My whole thing is I want to focus on the fellowship of the church. So do me a favor. If you have your Bible, I would like you to open to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 24. When you get there, say amen, and uh, I will read it in the church. It will be awesome as you watch me fumble over my words a little bit. Fantastic. I didn't hear any amen, so I assume it's okay for us. Thank you. <laughs> then why didn't y'all say amen? I gave you the answer. <laughs> All right. So this is about the fellowship of the believers right after Pentecost. And it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe in many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is an amazing verse where we can really start to dig into what the fellowship of Christ is truly like. A little bit of history here. This was right after Pentecost. In Jerusalem is the pilgrimage that the Jews would take. And Jerusalem could hold about 100,000 people. Not a whole lot of people. It's not truthfully a very big town back then. But during these pilgrimages, Jew, uh, the Jewish Hebrew people from all of Israel would come and congregate right here um, during Pentecost, and it would hit upwards to numbers of 900,000 people. That's an insane amount of people if your town is averaging at 100,000. And that's not crazy if your town's ready for it and they know it's going to come. And this happens about three times a year with the Feast of Tabernacles, Pentecost, and then um, whatever. Thank you so much. This is why we have our other elders, when I cannot get my own words right. But the issue here, and there was the issue, is that they stayed. They, they had revival, and everybody stayed in Jerusalem. So now Jerusalem has so many more people than it could ever have accounted for. So we see, but they couldn't leave. They absolutely couldn't leave. They needed to be filled with the Spirit. They were filled with the Spirit, but they don't have I wrote this down. Oh, my goodness. Thank you all for uh, allowing me to find where I wrote my stuff. So they were equipping new believers. It's funny. That's how long it took me to find equipping new believers. But they were. They were equipping new believers. And in this time, they didn't have enough food. They couldn't provide for everyone. Not everyone had a place to stay. So we see all the apostles. We see the believers. They start to, in here, we see them sell their property and start to give them to anyone in need. They're breaking bread. People are just piling into other people's houses. They're having church. And they're having this little commune thing because no one can survive without it. Because they're not going back home. They're enjoying the presence of God and God is sustaining them. So we're seeing everyone sell everything they have just to make enough money to provide for the people around them. I think this is an excellent thing because we're seeing this now. Like we're seeing revival of people spending well over, well over a week in a place where they're not actually supposed to be. They need to go home. But we're watching people provide for them and bring them in so they can be equipped. Because the cool part about revival is what happens in the post. When we're seeing revival happen, when we're seeing people get together, that's the filling of the Spirit. We're watching people get filled. We're watching people get equipped. But what we see about revival is what happens in the post. What do you do after that? There's one thing to get filled. There's one thing to be equipped. There's another thing to actually use that. So now we see all these people come out, right? 
And we see them spread throughout Jua, Ju- uh, Judea, Samaria, the rest of the world, all from what happened in the revival in Jerusalem. This is the important thing about fellowship, because none of this can serve my man. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but it's the fellowship that keeps them together. Loving someone unconditionally and even having a good word is all great, but you need to have the fellowship to keep it together. Because I know I have met people who've loved me unconditionally. I've met people who have given me the word that I needed to keep going forward. But without the fellowship to go with it, I f- follow. I, f- I don't follow. Fellowship. I don't follow them. Just because I get the love I need, just because I get the, uh, the word I need, it doesn't mean I don't have, I need my friends. I need my church family. Because what keeps me in the church is not, truthfully, is not the word on Sunday morning. It's not the worship that I get to enjoy. It's the fellowship that I get to have. What keeps me here is knowing that I have people who love and trust me and want me to succeed. They want me to be better, who have invested in me. This is what keeps me here because what that does is that kind of fellowship that allows me to feel like this is a home for me allows me to give to other people. That agape, unconditional love, I can give that to other people because I've experienced it in the church. I get to give a word to other people to hopefully bring them to Christ But because somebody invested in me first, because somebody taught me the Bible first, I didn't pull this thing out and just read it one day and say, yep, got it. Not at all. I promise you, if I had ever opened this Bible and said to myself, yeah, I got it, is insane. Someone had to explain this to me. I'm not a good reader. Heck, I proved it by failing at reading my own notes. (laughs) I'm not a good reader. I need stuff explained to me. And it works because I'm also very, I'm not a very strong conformist. I'm, I tend to be a little argumentative at times. So when I'm here and people are talking to me in fellowship, I get to have that. And they love me regardless of my argumentativeness. And they help me work through it, my sass. And, they help, and I get help working through these processes. It's like, I do. Sometimes I'll hear something and I'm immediately like, no, that's messed up. I would never do that. And then, like, you know, through time, I realize that, oh, I definitely lack humility. (laughs) But this is why we need the fellowship. It's not enough to just show up on Sunday morning. It has never been enough to show up on Sunday morning. One hour a week, heck, I'm going to finish it, and your word is going to be less than 30 minutes a week. That's not enough. It's the fellowship that will keep us here. It's the fellowship that will guide us to a closer relationship with Christ. Now, this is the coolest part about fellowship and friendship, is I have an example for you, and I love it. It's the one I gave a year ago, and it's it's the funniest thing in the world to me because it has everything to do with horses. So you can put up the next slide for me. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. (laughs) I lost my computer. Now, go ahead and put up the next slide for me. It will be a bunch of horses. Now, you'll love this. You, Clydesdale, fantastic, because that's what we're going to talk about. So, these are draft horses. And has anyone ever seen a draft horse? Like, has anyone seen a draft horse in person? It is the most intimidating thing I have ever seen in my life. Like, I'm going to be honest. Like, I feel like a horse shouldn't be intimidating. But when you're next to one, and it's like, wouldn't fit in this room. I, <laughs> I may be over exaggerating. I just know I was really scared next to that beast. Um, but they're big animals. But here's a cool fact about them: is are you aware that one of these one one draft horse can pull eight thousand pounds on average? I mean, some can pull more or less, but averagely can pull about eight thousand pounds. It's a lot of weight for one horse to pull. This little horse phenomenon we got, though, is if we put two of these bad boys next to each other, you would assume that they can pull what? 16,000 pounds, pull double the weight. Well, the cool part about it is when they're working together, that's not true at all, they pull about 24,000 pounds. So when these two horses are working together, they can pull three times the weight that they could regularly from each one pulling 8,000 
thousand together pulling twenty four thousand. That's insane. But what that is not is koinonia fellowship. Working together is not the koinonia koinonia fellowship that we are talking about. What we are working for, and what I'm trying to show you today, is what happens when these two horses work together, but they've been working together for a while. So if these two horses, the same horses, had been trained together, had worked together, had been buddy horses, or dare I say, or dare I say, horse homies, I would, <laughs> dare I say, horse homies, um, <laughs> you will find this crazy thing of them working together, but being together. Not only are they not pulling 24,000, they're pulling 32,000 pounds. So a horse, a draft horse who is working together with its best friend horse is pulling four times as much as it could if it was by itself. That is the coin and a fellowship. It's not just working together. It's doing life together. Because when we see that, each horse is now individually pulling twice as much as they could if they were by themselves. That's not to down that 8,000 pounds is a lot of weight. And individually, we sometimes can carry a lot on our shoulders and really feel that we've got this because 8,000 pounds is nothing to scoff at. But the issue is that stuff breaks you down. The issue is 8,000 pounds is still heavy, and it pushes you down. But when you have a friend who sticks closer than a brother, who walks through life with you, you will pull twice as much as you ever could alone. And it, I promise you, it will never feel as heavy. That 16,000 pounds of weight that is on your shoulders walking with a brother or a sister will never ever feel as heavy as that 8,000 pounds alone. We, we see it all throughout the Bible. Jesus sends them out two by two. We have Matthew 18, 12, where two or more together, I will be there. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Following in step with Christ, walking together with that one person, two people, three people. Because imagine, right? That is how much is being pulled with two horses. Imagine if you put in three, four, five. That is exponentially. Heck, it's more fuel efficient for two of these horses to pull like a hundred of them instead of all of them walk themselves. Like, it's insane. <laughs> well, horse efficient. They're not using fuel. But this is the amazing, like, this is the amazing truth of the fellowship that we get to have with each other. This is why church makes us stronger. This is why. You being by yourself and saying I'm a part of the church never works because you can't do it by yourself. You need people around you. It's set up that way. Christianity's set up that way. Our God, Jesus Christ, couldn't do it by himself. He says so, that he does nothing without his father. He felt fatigue, and he left, and he separated himself with 12 of his boys. Like, and he got together and talked about it. He felt that pressure. To show us that it's not meant to be done alone, that Christianity can't be done alone. Christianity shouldn't be done alone. Because when we do it alone, we suffer in silence. And my Bible, my Bible says we don't suffer in silence. That we are never to do that. We, we read time and time again of people who are just outwardly yelling, God save me. I'm feeling terrible. I need help. But then we read how they bring people alongside of them. The prophets gave it to a successor over and over again. We have Paul and Barnabas. Without them two, oh my goodness, I couldn't imagine what half the New Testament would look like. But we tend to hold things in out of fear or embarrassment, present party included. I preach on a lot of things that I'm weak in, and this is something I'm weak in, but I have gotten so much better at it. Why? Because I have my horse homies. I do. And they've walked me through processes. They've been there for me. They've seen me weep. They've seen me cry. Heck, this week they've seen me weep and cry. Truthfully, I cry a lot. <laughs> About good and bad things. It doesn't matter. But, <laughs> but keeping them close is important. 
they're the reason that I haven't fallen from the faith. They're the reason that I've been able to go to Jesus when I felt like he's not listening. Or I've been able to get on my knees and talk to God when I felt like there was no God left in me. It was them who encouraged me. Because alone, I'm going to fall. Alone, 8,000 pounds is going to destroy me. But together, 16,000 pounds is just a normal Tuesday. This is the important of koinonia. This is why fellowship is so important. My encouragement to you, and when I gave the message to the youth, to them, was to look for that person. Pray for it. Diligently pray for it. Fast about it. Because that person or people that you're going to bring alongside you are what is going to keep you here. Because they're going to guide you when you feel like you can't do much. When you feel like you've lost your identity a little bit. They're going to remind you who you are. Because you can't lie to yourself when everybody, when all your friends are sitting there like, wait, I know the truth about you. Why are you saying this? These are your horse homies. It's funny. We've been saying that for the last year. I don't know if any of you ever heard that. Uh, we call ourselves the horse homies all the time. We think it's the funniest thing in the world. Actually, they're doing it kind of make fun of me because I didn't think of it in the moment. I was actually really embarrassed because all the kids were making fun of me because they're like, oh, you're a horse boy. And I'm like, yeah, they're horse homies. So it's just fun. But that's the message. The message is, an, is a message of encouragement. That there's a reason we come to church is to be filled and equipped to go out into the world. But remember, if you're filled and equipped to go alone, you will fall. 8,000 pounds is always heavier alone than it is with 16,000 in a buddy. All right? So, Lord, I thank you for this, and I thank you for the message, and I thank you for everybody here. Lord, I ask that you lift them up, and you would just would bless every single person. I would ask Jesus that anybody here who doesn't have somebody that they can trust and rely on, that you would bring them in, Jesus that you would bring someone to walk alongside of them. But we are not meant to do life alone, and Christianity is not a single-person sport. It is meant to be done together, where we can fall in love, where we can cry on each other's shoulders, where we can make each other strong as we lift each other up. You said, where two or more are there, I will be there. So God, I choose to trust in that. I choose to trust that you will always show up when we need you your great grace, Jesus. We love you as we just live in your grace and we walk in your peace. In your mighty name, amen. Such a good word. Such a good word. I want to give us an opportunity to respond to that word too. Um, I had no idea what he was speaking about, although I definitely have heard about the horse homies before. Um, <laughs> They're actually my pony homies um, since they're so so much younger. Um, that Are ponies younger than horses? Yes, I thought I got that right. Okay, that, that kind of didn't go over well. Um, <laughs> and I believe that we, we do need to cross generational lines and have friends. Um, I saw a testimony this week of a man who was at least in his 70s, if not close to 80, who was at the Asbury Revival in 1970. And he had tears in his eyes when he, he was talking about when he was a college student. And he had tears on his, in his eyes talking about how God moved then. And when he heard it about it again, he had to get there again. And that generational blessings that are passed down, it's not just about finances, passing that down to your, your children. <clears throat> but, you know, I mean, mom, dad, I, I want that too. But it's generational blessings, right? It's the prayers that are passed down. It's the it's the, um, it's the example, it's the, it's the legacy, and I want to be able to do that for my children as well, and, I, and, and, and not just for my physical children, but for those who, in that generation. And so I, I, one encouragement that I want to have for you today that I feel like the Lord is saying to us, would you make room in your heart um, for enlargement? And what I mean by that is not so that we can grow and be some whatever, but that you make room in your heart that you can have some more friends than the friends that you already have. Some of you have very well-connected horse homies already, and that's awesome. But there's still people who don't even have one godly Christian friend. And when I got saved um, in the late 90s, if it was not for my dear Christian sister, who is a minister still to this day, that we still talk often and encourage one another, I don't think I would be where I'm at today. She was that iron that sharpens iron. And then, of course, my number one horse homie right here behind me. We need that. 
But would you open your heart, even though I have that, and I have been blessed, and I have family, I have children, I have people that I love. I, I, I want my heart to enlarge so that I can, I can, so we can see rows and rows and rows of people loving the Lord and knowing God. Ask the Lord to enlarge your heart for more fellowship because I do believe that it's still an, oh, the weakest area of our church that we need to grow in that art. We need we need to grow in bringing people in. And I think it's because we came out of COVID where we were, you know, social isolation for so long that we don't know how to bring people in anymore. And God, that was confirmation. Jeremy, I had no idea this is the word you were going to speak on, but the Lord has um, dropped in my heart for us to begin micro groups because people say, oh, your church is already small. Why do you need small groups? Because you really still can't do life with 50 people. You got to have micro groups. Jesus broke it down from 12 to 3 to 1. And we have to, we have to break that down where we can have some, some, some micro groups. And listen, I'm not a micromanager. So if you feel like God has put something on your heart to start, let's start. We're still in the beginning. God is doing things. Come together. Let's share our ideas. Let's share our plans. Let's do this. Would you stand to your feet if you're able with me today? We're going to open up just as a time um, for prayer. I'm going to ask Jeremy to come on up and, and um, help pray as well. Um, Andrew, if you could come up and help help pray as well. Come, just stand right up here. Um, Bessie, if you're, if you're able to come up and, and help help pray. The reason I'm asking these, these three, and, it, and this is not against anyone else, if you feel like you want to pray, come pray too. But these three right here, I've noticed um, going out their way, and others too, but going out their way to make friends. And I want us to pray that we would learn to truly Christian fellowship. Acts chapter 2 was never supposed to stay in the upper room, and it didn't. And this move that God is doing now is also not supposed to just stay in our church buildings, but to go out, and we need friends in order to do that. So if you would bow your, your heads and close your eyes. If you feel led to have the Lord help enlarge your heart, to let more people in, would you just raise your hand before the Lord? Raise your hand before the Lord. That means you got to get out of your comfort zone. Man, I'm telling you, I'm an extrovert, and I even turned into an introvert after 2020. <laughs> so if you're already an introvert, I, I know. It's easy just to be by ourselves, but we got to get out of our comfort zone. If you're in this place and you want to learn to um, pour into other people more so, would you just raise your hand before the Lord? Raise your hand before the Lord, yeah. And if you're in this room and you feel like, I don't have that, that horse homie, but I want that person that could be an iron that sharpens iron, a person who could be a friend that we can do life together. Uh, you don't have, you could also raise your hand and, and, and ask the Lord to, to give you that. I don't know who that person is going to be, but God does. And if you rose your hand today and you want some extra prayer, I'm going to ask you, would you just come even right now and just come right up here at, at this altar? Just come up here. We want to pray for you. We got some anointing oil somewhere around here and uh, we want to be able to pray for you. So if, if you, if you rose your hand, you said, you know what? I, I want to I wanna be a part of this. I want my heart to be enlarged. I want to reach out to more people. I want to love more people. I want to be friends with more people. And I want to be a good friend to the people that I already have as a friend. Would you come on up here? We want to pray for you.